Uh, thanks so much, um, everybody, for joining. Um, it's my pleasure to um, put on a clean shirt and <laughs> give this webinar today. Um, as Brock said, I'm uh, chair for the Society uh, for Ecological Restoration, or SER, vice chair of the Global Partnership for Forest and Landscape Restoration, the GPFLR, which doesn't really roll off the tongue very well, but we'll, we'll just have to do. Um, So I, I thought I'd uh, just give you a, a quick um, uh, review for those who aren't familiar with um, SER. It uh, um, was founded in 1988 by practitioners and scientists. It's a membership organization quite a bit different from most um, professional um, societies in that we do have both um, uh, people working in the field and, and science scientists as well. And the whole um, idea is to link those two uh, uh, components, the science and practice, and that um, goes ahead and into our um, mission state statement as well. We're trying to advance the science practice and policy of ecological restoration. Um, right now we have uh, well over 3,000 um, uh, members, um, Again, scientists and researchers, practitioners, but we've got uh, government staff, indigenous people, students, artists, um, which is nice um, for uh, diversity, with 13 chapters um, throughout the world. Um, uh, we're developing a, an Africa uh, chapter at the moment and working on an Asian uh, chapter as well. And then we've got student um, associations as well, and two thematic uh, sections, one on large ecosystem restoration, then one on uh, international network for seed-based restoration. And our core programs are in science. Um, we publish the uh, uh, journal Restoration Ecology. We're now hosting a restoration resource center uh, to provide a knowledge hub uh, for people working on uh, different restoration projects. Um, we also have a book series with Island Press. In terms of practice, we have a uh, certification program for uh, restoration practitioners, um, uh, which has um, been very successful. And we deliver um, conferences both um, internationally and regionally, uh, and also webinars, workshops, and field trips and the like. Uh, also, uh, have uh, recently published, as Brock said, the International Principles and Standards for the Practice of Ecological Restoration. Uh, which appeared in Restoration Ecology last September. And then in terms of policy, we're um, engaging with um, various uh, international entities to promote and uh, uh, improve the quality of restoration, um, as well as um, uh, get increased um, funding for it. And we've convened uh, various global fora as well. So that's SCR in a, a nutshell. Um, the Global Partnership on Forest and Landscape Restoration uh, is an organization or, or, or yeah, really an organization of organizations. It was formed in 2003 uh, really to build support for restoration amongst um, decision makers and to uh, really provide an information network. Uh, we have over 30 uh, members now. The initial core group is primarily uh, UN organizations, uh, the CBD, the FAO, IUCN, um, and um, w WF, WRI, um, UNCCD. Um, but in uh, probably over the last uh, seven years or so, uh, the partnership opened up for to um, a non-government organization. Um, they're also uh, such as SER, um, uh, uh, Global Forest Generation, uh, and others, uh, World Vision uh, as well. And uh, as well as so it's the, the uh, UN, uh, we've got governments, uh, particularly um, Germany, the Netherlands um, have been very active, uh, universities, uh, uh, and um, 
uh, most importantly, um, some of the important uh, funders of restoration, the, the Jeff Secretariat, the Global Environment Facility Secretariat, and also the World Bank and its um, forest programs. So the GPFLR had the initial aim of um, becoming just a network to uh, move the restoration agenda forward, uh, but uh, that, um, uh, I wouldn't say it culminated, but it uh, got uh, substantial um, attraction with a support of a bond challenge in 2011 to restore 150 million um, hectares of, of forest. So I'll have a little bit more about um, FLR or GPFLR and what it does um, as we move forward. Um, but I wanted to start with this um, uh, uh, picture I happened to find. I'm a dog person myself, and so it popped out at me. It says, look what ha happens when you cut down too many trees. And um, dogs rarely queue for um, uh, doing their business outside, um, but, but it, it does um, raise some questions. And uh, particularly in this, this time of COVID-19, where when um, we take out too many trees, the end result is that animals um, may migrate, um, particularly uh, things like fruit bats. Uh, it forces animals to congregate in smaller area, areas, and people are much more likely to encounter them. And so in the case with COVID-19, um, we know that it's highly likely that it was a, 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 a fruit bat as a vector, um, for the disease, um, they've been um, used as bush meat, and consequently, um, you know, deforestation. Um, uh, another uh, example I saw recently was that in uh, Philippines, uh, bats were forced to migrate because of forest fires, which prevented them from obtaining uh, the fruit that they require. And uh, through migration, they um, uh, got near um, uh, pigs, and the pigs, whether they um, ate leftover fruit from the bats, or um, which would be my um, hypothesis, uh, then transmitted a virus to humans, which was um, highly um, uh, lethal. And so we can expect these kinds of occurrences um, more frequently, I think, in, in the future. Uh, I also wanted to mention that as um, uh, landscapes are, are altered, particularly by climate change, uh, we know, for example, that about 40% of the, the terrestrial uh, sur surface of the globe is in arid um, conditions. Those conditions are where the the average or, or the mean annual uh, precipitation divided by the mean annual evo transpiration um, is less than uh, 0.65, and those areas are expected to increase by 10 to 20 percent by the end of the decade under business as usual. Um, and in addition, the climate envelope that uh, people uh, have survived under for you know thousands of years is going to be shifted, which will result in uh, not only changes in migration of people, but also uh, changes in utilization of, of the landscapes. So just a, a couple of things I wanted to bring up just from this one little picture here. So uh, let's go on to, um, the restoration component, and many of you probably know uh, the excitement around um, different international uh, efforts for restoration. Really beginning in, in 2011 um, with the, the Convention on Biological Diversity and uh, the uh, approval of the IET biodiversity targets by the parties 
with um, Target 15 had a goal of uh, restoring at least 15% of degraded uh, ecosystems. Now, at that time, it was uh, primarily um, in view of, of carbon um, sequestration. But you, the European Union also has a biodiversity strategy um, with a similar goal of restoring at least 15% of degraded ecosystems. Uh, I anticipate that that goal will um, continue on through 2030, but that is, uh, I think, under negotiation at the current time. The bond challenge beginning in 2011 um, at a goal of restoring 150 million hectares by uh, 2020, uh, and then through the New York Declaration on Forests, an additional 200 million uh, hectares by 2030. So the overall goal is. 350 million uh, hectares. Now, under the Sustainable Development Goals, it, in fact, um, restoration can play a role in all of the, uh, these goals, but um, there is a, a component of restoring degraded forests um, and restoring degraded land uh, through 2030. Now, uh, equally exciting um, was the uh, uh, UN General Assembly's uh, resolution to declare uh, 2021 to 2030 of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. So it was adopted last March, it had 72 co-sponsors, which is um, uh, quite amazing, uh, with uh, uh, intent to prevent, halt, and reverse ecosystem degradation and to raise awareness of the importance of ecosystem restoration. And this is uh, held for all terrestrial and marine ecosystems. And of course, obviously builds on the existing commitments um, that I mentioned before. I did for forget to mention that the, the UN Convention on uh, Combating Desertification also has uh, the Landscape um, uh, degradation neutrality um, uh, component, which um, uh, really um, parallels the, the CBD. Um, so, and within the bond challenge, there are, are initiatives in Latin America, initiative 20 by 20, and also um, for Africa, AFR um, 100. So for the decade, FAO and UNEP are the lead implementers um, in collaboration with CBD, UNCCD, and uh, the uh, climate uh, convention as well. And so um, uh, my hope is that all of these conventions can um, really work in parallel to move the restoration uh, agenda forward. So I wanted to talk really about um, the issues of, of um, uh, forest and landscape restoration, uh, sometimes it's referred to as forest landscape restoration. Um, uh, you can uh, really take your pick, I guess, but uh, most people just call it FLR. And we can define it as a process um, which really aims to uh, regain ecological integrity and enhance human well-being in landscapes that have been deforested or degraded. So those two key components have to be there, regaining ecological integrity and enhancing human well-being um, for it to be FLR. And uh, in our little preface to um, principles of forest um, or FLR, uh, we're really regaining, improving, maintaining uh, vital ecological and social functions uh, at, with uh, long-term results of uh, landscapes which are resilient and sustainable. Uh, the principles of FLR were published by the GPFLR and uh, Bissot uh, uh, and others in 2018. I'll give you the website at the end of my talk um, if you're interested in looking at it. So what are the principles? Well, the first uh, uh, key principle is that 
uh, we are focusing on landscapes. So when we begin the process of, of FLR, we're um, looking both within and across uh, landscapes and not individual sites. So it's not a project-oriented um, approach. And across these landscapes, there can be uh, various types of, of land use and management uh, practices going under, uh, ongoing. And with different types of uh, land tenure systems and governance systems. And, but it's a, a scale where ecologists, uh, sociologists, and economists uh, can balance their um, priorities. Of particular importance in FLR and, and probably in restoration activities actually is that um, stakeholders have to be um, engaged um, at uh, various scales. And these include uh, uh, groups that are vulnerable um, to uh, uh, landscape degradation and uh, deforestation. Uh, those should be brought in in planning and decision making regarding how the land is used, what the goals of restoration are, uh, what the strategies might be, how everything is implemented, and how the benefits of uh, restoration interventions will be shared. And then there also has to be some way to monitor uh, and assess uh, and review uh, the processes. The third principle, uh, addresses the restoration of multiple functions within uh, landscapes for multiple benefits. So our interventions are trying to restore ecological function, but also social and economic functions as well across um, uh, a landscape. And to provide a range of ecosystem goods and services that um, will benefit the multiple stakeholder groups. The fourth component is maintain and enhance natural ecosystems within landscapes. Particularly important in um, uh, restoration that um, uh, the notion that if, if we uh, can restore uh, a degraded landscape, that we can go ahead and convert or destroy uh, natural forests as a fallacy. Um, we know uh, that um, uh, for ecological restoration projects that have been conducted, that um, the return towards a reference can be very, very slow. Uh, we may not um, achieve um, but a, uh, a small percentage of the, the biodiversity and function uh, that previously um, had been there. And so our approach through FLR is, is not to do that, but to enhance uh, the conservation and, and recovery and, and management of these forests. So FLR also has to be tailored to the local context um, and can take on a variety of different types of interventions. Uh, for example, um, but they have to be adapted to, you know, the local social, cultural, economic, and ecological values, their needs, and landscape history. And I'll give an example in, in a little bit. Um, we want to use the best um, science and practice that we have, uh, take advantage of uh, traditional and indigenous knowledge uh, where that's possible. And apply that information in the context of the local capacities uh, and the, the governance structures that um, are uh, in place. Uh, we also finally want to manage adaptively for the long term resilience of these uh, systems. Now, the UN decade is 2021 to 2030. Uh, we need to be uh, thinking past 2030 in terms of how we're going to um, uh, continue uh, interventions where necessary or um, uh, approaches to um, the, the land use. 
Uh, but we're, we're trying to use approaches that enhance species um, and genetic diversity, which we can, can modify over time with um, climate and other uh, changes in uh, conditions. So we're, we're in a place where we can um, change course if it's necessary or if it allows us to um, improve or if uh, the needs of our stakeholders, uh, of the stakeholders change. Uh, we would really like to uh, have a, a system where we can monitor uh, success, uh, provide that research and uh, guidance, which can be uh, further integrated. So what does this look like on a, a landscape? In, in many uh, regions in Africa, uh, some parts of uh, South America, um, uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, there's really a, a mosaic of, of possibilities uh, where up in the uh, upper uh, left corner of the graph, I don't think I can, no, I guess I can. Um, we have protected primary forest. Um, we have degraded primary forest where uh, we may uh, want to uh, uh, do some uh, interventions. systems, uh, permanent pasture uh, areas of um, intense agricultural uh, use, which uh, could in fact be uh, uh, improved in some cases by uh, uh, restorative uh, approaches uh, in terms of uh, improving soil quality. Uh, we have a, a riparian system uh, going through this uh, cartoon that doesn't look very good. It's possible that um, riparian uh, interventions uh, could occur there as well. So I wanted to take you um, to uh, a little model project that I uh, visited last year on Biloran Island in the Philippines. The Philippines, um, as in many areas, um, saw really widespread um, uh, logging through the last um, century. And I believe there's only about 3% of primary forests left. Um, up on the, the tops of the uh, peaks on this uh, picture is um, second growth forest. And um, one of the um, uh, livelihood opportunities is uh, production of palm oil. So you see some um, palm oil trees here. And the uh, project was developed, um, and I'll, I'll describe the, the governance structure uh, in a moment, but was developed to um, provide um, agricultural uh, resources, um, uh, maintain a, a plantation for future harvest, and protect, protect um, uh, secondary growth of conservation uh, value. And so, uh, this requires, of course, a uh, considerable amount of um, uh, uh, capacity building uh, to uh, uh, inform people what the, the possibilities are, uh, to be able to um, produce seedlings for um, eventual planting, and then also for uh, an agricultural component, in this case, um, uh, growing pineapples as well as the, the palm oil. So um, uh, this chart uh, shows um, uh, this one uh, community-based um, pilot project. And uh, there's one area which is all in, in coconut plantation. There are two blocks which are uh, under, going to undergo uh, reforestation. There's an old acacia plantation um, that's uh, being maintained. And then there's secondary forest, which is um, being protected. And down here is a communal pasture land and uh, uh, areas for uh, growing agricultural uh, crops. So 
uh, using the chart that um, was published in a recent um, uh, paper from IUFRO, um, showing how uh, the structure can be. In the Philippines, they developed in, in 2011 a national greening program for uh, restoring uh, forests. And that's managed through the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, uh, which collaborates with um, uh, universities, the University of, of Sunshine Coast, for example, has been involved in this project. And then the local community, which um, requires um, uh, facilitation in, in um, all the things I've mentioned in terms of uh, capacity building. So we have the overall national governance structure saying we really need to do something about the loss of, of forest uh, to facilitation through um, uh, local people who act as really um, extension people, and then the actual um, implementation by uh, the local community. And I'll mention for the, the Milleran community that um, the leaders are all women, um, and uh, they're doing an incredible uh, amount of work. Um, some are um, raising children, some um, have older children who have left for, um, the larger cities, uh, Manila in particular. And so one also has to think about here for this particular uh, project, what the, the future uh, may hold. Uh, there are two things. One is um, how long will this be funding, be funded? Uh, most of these uh, types of projects are in, uh, under a, a short three-year term. Um, they do require um, results. So if um, money goes into um, planting, uh, the expectation is that there'll be a certain uh, survivorship of, of those plants. Uh, but the second thing is that what's going to happen as um, uh, younger people migrate? Will there be sufficient uh, capacity left to, to maintain these um, types of systems? So these are, are difficult issues. Uh, recently, um, Nick Munsey, uh with the uh, Canadian Forest Service um, developed a, a framework for uh, FLR interventions in, in Canada. I thought I'd just share it uh, uh, fairly quickly. It um, follows pretty much um, the, the guidance that would, that would uh, be in the uh, SAR uh, principles and, and standards uh, for ecological restoration. And uh, in terms of uh, need to identify what the opportunities are, where, where can uh, restoration be accomplished, what are the, the drivers. Um, and in many countries, there's also been uh, uh, considerable emphasis on, on where we can uh, get the best value for uh, the dollars invested in uh, restoration. Although I will say that in general, the, the return on investment is quite high. Uh, so identifying um, the opportunities, but then the next level is really uh, uh, identifying those people that can make it happen, the stakeholders, and, and have a, a, a mechanism for uh, governing work. And um, it may be that the policies and regulations that uh, could support um, restoration may uh, change. Somebody's walking right on my screen. Um, <laughs> uh, the third component here is, is resource mobilization, uh, getting the, the um, funding through existing uh, national or, or regional um, programs. Uh, so there could be different mechanisms for that. Um, uh, climate finance instruments or payment for ecosystem services. And certainly um, there's more uh, interest in uh, private sector involvement, not only in Canada, but, but globally. The fourth component really going from, okay, we've decided where we can think we can do things and uh, we've got the resources now, 
um, is to actual implementation and monitoring and using um, science-based approaches uh, to implement and monitor um, the uh, criteria we're going to use, um, uh, the types of data that we're going to uh, uh, need to get, and, and the, the best practices to, to use. And then uh, there are always trade-offs um, uh, from uh, restoration activities and those have as well. Um, and then um, through uh, the this lower idea of, of dialoguing, figuring out what we're going to do to um, uh, initiating, monitoring, uh, and cycling back, evaluating our work um, is an adaptive management um, uh, scenario, really. And so finally, uh, we're going to use everything that we learned to uh, further develop our knowledge network. Uh, and uh, continually uh, improve what we're doing. And of course, um, with um, climate change, uh, we may have to do uh, considerable <laughs> additional work. So I just wanted to uh, make a shout out to uh, some of the tools that are already available um, uh, uh, make the initial assessment assessments. Um, the Rome or the Restoration Opportunities Assessment Methodology developed by um, IUCN and, and World Resources Institute uh, has been used in 27 or so uh, different countries to identify somewhere around, uh, I think, 160 uh, million uh, hectares for uh, restoration. There are tools uh, being developed to uh, help in implementation of restoration, diversity uh, uh, for restoration uh, has provided one uh, tool specific to uh, certain regions in Colombia, but um, I'm sure that some, it can act as a model for many other uh, things where you uh, assess what the characteristics of your uh, uh, restoration area is, uh, what your objectives are, the types of species you want, and, and some additional options. So, FLR is also um, uh, considerably important in, um, in in the future, I think, in, in terms of uh, maintaining protected areas. Uh, this uh, cartoon comes from Ecosphere Plus. Uh, they're working with an NGO in Peru at uh, Cordillera Azul National Park. It's a fairly large park, 1.6 million hectares. But the surrounding area, I think, adds another maybe uh, 4 million hectares or so. Um, and within that, um, uh, let's say three or four uh, million hectares, are um, people who are uh, largely um, natural resource um, based. Uh, so uh, the profile would be to for agricultural use for uh, uh, wood and fiber um, uh, in that region. And uh, deforestation, uh, can occur um, uh, to uh, produce cacao, um, uh, other types of agricultural uh, products. So the notion of FLR here is really to um, provide a buffer where people can um, uh, maintain livelihoods. Uh, so down on the, the lower tranche here, um, they're trying to work with about 5,000 um, residents uh, to ensure fresh water and sanitation, uh, produce jobs um, with a large number or larger number of, of women employed, and develop sustainable enterprises, uh, while also maintaining uh, the forest systems, protecting uh, vulnerable species, and uh, ensuring uh, carbon credits. So that's this is kind of the epitome of FLR, really, in um, uh, uh, kind of mixed-use um, 
in this case around the protected area and really buffering and protecting uh, that area. Um, uh, so uh, this I might add are the, the impact targets for 2021. They haven't been achieved yet. Uh, similarly, in the, the Amazon basin, uh, this chart um, was uh, or map was recently published, and it shows in orange uh, indigenous uh, territory, and in green protected areas, and where it's hatched, it's um, uh, an overlap of, of the two. But I'm going to flip over to another slide, and if you um, simply right now look at this region when I flip the slide. You'll see that um, it's much browner, and that's the above ground uh, carbon density. And so, in areas outside of um, uh, the protected areas and uh, indigenous territories, if I go back up, um, you can see um, the reduction in, in uh, uh, carbon with uh, deforestation, uh, burning, uh, and conversion. A similar um, chart shows uh, the changes in above ground carbon uh, uh, density and red being um, the, the, the largest losses. And again, down in this region, you can see ringing around these protected areas are um, uh, changes. So here too, um, uh, the conversion where uh, it could be halted or, or where at least those um, protected areas could be buffered from uh, uh, additional intrusion uh, would be uh, useful. So uh, one, one interesting thing about FLR, it's been um, uh, really discussed for over 20 years. We, we know a lot about uh, what can happen, but we have, um, fairly limited examples over uh, a long period of time. And many of the examples um, that are used to understand FLR are fairly old um, and, and actually predate um, uh, the, the notion, but we can still um, uh, learn from them, even though they don't address all of the, the FLR principles. And I just wanted to mention a few um, that, um, Stan Turf and, and his colleagues um, offered after reviewing uh, about a dozen different uh, case studies. And that um, the need for um, good collaboration and participation um, and uh, moving that forward with um, a lot of capacity building and technical um, assistance and using incentives um, and uh, to um, uh, get uh, appropriate behavior, uh, improve communication, strengthen political support, utilize appropriate knowledge and methods, all kind of human um, issues and not technical, um, well, some, some degree technical and then include monitoring and so that we actually know uh, what's happening. Now I wanted to um, just consider monitoring uh, very briefly uh, from uh, some work that Lee um, and, and colleagues conducted or published in 2014, where uh, they were looking at uh, reforestation success in the Philippines. Um, they found they came up with 98 potential success drivers, um, technical ones, biophysical ones, socioeconomic, institutional policy and, and management, and uh, the characteristics of the, the projects themselves. And then had 12 success indicators on forest establishment, and growth, uh, environmental conditions, and also social. And they were able to, on uh, Leyte Island and the Philippines, um, look at 43 different uh, restoration uh, projects. So uh, this is the kind of graph that I would never have allowed my students to present in a, in a talk, um, but it, it shows, and we, and 
uh, I'm just going to limit my discussion of that. Uh, it shows the uh, su success indicators in uh, dark, and the drivers are the boxes um, that, that are um, uh, open. And then linkages between indicators and indicators and drivers and indicators. So out of this complex graph, what I what I want there's really two points. I want to uh, talk briefly about um, oops. Um, about the, the um, test drivers um, starting down in the lower area here. So direct payment for planning, <laughs> a success driver. Uh, the dependence on local people for forests for subsist subsistence, a driver. Uh, the funding, how it's funded is a success driver. Road conditions, which I, I guess was not anticipated to be one, was also a driver if you, if you get there. Um, how the areas were protected. Uh, and then education, uh, developing um, uh, awareness about the project. We're all success drivers. But the point of this graph really is not that, um, that we can identify them, but that um, these, inter these drivers um, can, and, can interact with one another. So it's not a linear system, and it's not hierarchical at all. So I get what we've been doing recently, um, and which I hope will we'll move forward, was, well, how, how do we know when, a, when, when we've got FLR on the ground? So we have six principles. We can establish criteria uh, for these principles, and then decide on some kind of indicator uh, scheme. Uh, recently, um, Vicky Gutierrez and Liz Ota and I and, and some others uh, started assessing current indicator frameworks. And actually, none of them address all of the, the six principles that the uh, GPFLR put forward. And all of them are, are, are hierarchical in structure. And so, since we anticipate interactions and nonlinear relationships, we really need to be thinking about the types of frameworks that we can use to uh, assess uh, uh, what's happening um, on the ground. Because there, there's a lot going on. We've got the, the social component, the economic component, we've got the ecological component um, all happening. Okay, so well, let's move on with uh, the decade. We've got um, uh, Lots of excitement. We've got um, really renewed awareness, and this uh, slide, by the way, is from uh, UNEP. Um, we're not starting um, at zero at all. We've been doing quite a lot over the last um, uh, really 40, 30, 40 years. Uh, and people are, are really more engaged. And if there is a silver lining of uh, our current predicament, it may be that, that people uh, are more aware of um, uh, disparities, um, uh, uh, asymmetries in, in, in uh, wealth and distribution. Um, and we also have uh, different communication tools where um, uh, information doesn't have to come uh, from the boss on down, but can spread uh, sideways through our systems. So uh, that kind of approach is uh, the one taken by 1T.org, um, which is uh, meant to uh, empower and mobilize uh, uh, a community of millions of people uh, to uh, address this problem. Uh, because there is a lot of momentum um, and there's opportunities um, at typically at the local level for people to uh, commit their time and resources. But there is also hesitation because um, simply planting trees uh, is not necessarily uh, going to work. Um, when I talked about success of, of reforestation projects, uh, if there wasn't continuity, if there wasn't uh, continued funding, uh, uh, 
uh, continued interest in the in, in the program. So we, we need to inspire not just for a short-term effort, but for a longer-term solution. And at the same time, recognizing that um, one tree species is not the same as another tree species, and so that um, we have to uh, think about uh, our approaches to uh, these uh, interventions and, and not just move um, head on. And this is um, a recent paper in Science published by uh, Karen Hall and Pedro Franco-Leon. So I think I'm up past my time. Um, uh, here are two um, websites that you can uh, refer to if you're interested uh, um, for more. So uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to should I stop sharing, Brock? I'm not sure what to do now. Thank you so much, Jim, for the really informative presentation. I wish you could have been seeing the chat as there was a really lively discussion among participants on all different ideas related to FLR. And I'm going to try to capture that for you. Um, okay. What I've done is I've sort of binned the conversations and questions into a few different themes. So apologies to the participants for not reading each of the comments and questions. Uh, the two of them are linked, um, really getting at FLR and ecological integrity and potential for non-target or non-restorative effects. And so I'll read a few of those comments. The first was about afforestation. And Susan Van Redsburg from South Africa says, looking out for savanna, rangelands, and grassland systems, exclamation points, making sure they don't get degraded by tree planting. Um, Non-native forest initiatives are killing water resources in many South African ecosystems. And then there were uh, a lively set of comments about use of non-native species. And I'll just read a few of those. I think the first one came from Abigail Garino, who says, the national greening program set up by our government focuses on the production of exotic species with little percent allotted for the planting of natives. Most of the time, it's a monoculture of mahogany or eucalyptus. My understanding is that forest restoration should focus on plants that are native to the area being rehabilitated with problems on the introduction of exotic species and anthropogenic threats to an area, how do we determine which species are native? And then after that, I won't read it, but there was some discussion about potentially whether using um, a few non-natives mixed with natives is better than no forest at all, et cetera. So I'll stop there and ask for your comments about how um, SER and GPFLR are dealing with promoting uh, strong ecological benefits from FLR. Okay, well, thanks for those questions. They're, they're um, uh, very critical questions, really. Um, let me address the, the issue of, of grassland uh, transition. And um, I, don't, I don't know of any uh, in the space that, that thinks that <laughs> converting grasslands to to forest um, is something that we want to do. Uh, most of this discussion came from the production of the, the WRI, WRI uh, global I think it's global restorations opportunities map that um, was produced a number of years ago, and that map showed. Um, savanna and grassland areas where there was the potential to grow trees based on um, uh, their work. Uh, uh, Joe Feldman and, and others um, uh, immediately pointed that out. Um, and I think that it's, it's pretty well understood that no, that's not something that, that we um, encourage happening. Um, now, the next question about exotics and monocultures is, is also important. In um, FLR, it is um, certainly possible to have as part of the landscape uh, a plantation. Um, 
to have everything in plantation would really not um, uh, be uh, considered FLR, uh, in my opinion. Uh, the and, and the use of exotics, um, that's a, a, a gnarly one. Um, and it also will depend upon the needs and desires of stakeholders. So for example, for eucalyptus, if the stakeholders want something that they can grow really quickly, uh, even though it may take a lot of water, um, they may decide that eucalyptus is what they want. Um, and if uh, there are uh, good reasons not to do that, to move to, to natives, I know there was um, work done in Kenya um, in restoring uh, uh, streams with native uh, vegetation rather than eucalyptus. And what they found was that uh, by using the, the native uh, tree species, that streams would run all year long. Where eucalyptus was grown, the streams would run for six months. So, um, and the eucalyptus there was um, uh, grown to, to burn uh, to dry tea. So, um, if one could, in fact, um, provide an alternative to uh, eucalyptus burning uh, to dry tea, uh, maybe a solar oven or, or something of, of that sort, then it would be possible to uh, educate the, the stakeholder um, and, and possibly transition away. Um, there is the, the situation where exotics can, in fact, outgrow native trees, and that's a, a risk. So we certainly, um, in areas, for example, that buffer um, uh, protected areas, we wouldn't want to use um, uh, those types of, of, of trees. So I, I hope that answered. If it hasn't, um, uh, yeah, thank let you. me know. Jim, um, I'll just add on, um, Jim mentioned the international principles and standards for ecological restoration. And there's a framing in the standards that may be helpful on this topic, which is the restorative continuum. And so it separates out ecological restoration from other kinds of restorative activities. And I'm mentioning this because Rosa um, Ortiz has asked um, or has said there's a LR principles with the question mark. And I think that's part of this whole conversation. Um, I want to switch topics here um, because there were a few uh, comments on gender and social issues, and then we'll probably have to wrap up because we're getting close to the hour. Um, I'm gonna read them all to you, Jim. There's just a few sort of on different topics, and then you can pick um, what you wanna respond to first and see where there's more time. Robin Sears commented on the number of women employed, and she took issue with your saying that 30% is a large number. And then, um, Consuelo Bonfil says on a different topic, I believe in all Latin American countries, addressing social issues and land tenure is much more important and complex. And then there was a comment, um, oh shoot, and I'm, I'm losing who mentioned it in my long list of comments here, but about ethical issues within FLR. And apologies to the asker of that question that I'm not getting that right. Okay. So we've got gender um, issues, ethics, and social issues in land tenure. Yeah, so um, that 30% is was a, a hypothetical, and for that area, I, I'm just assuming since it um, is a, a a goal that for that particular um, area that that might be um, uh, an improvement <laughs> over. Um, uh, the status quo. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I don't um, uh, have the full details on that. Uh, and certainly in, in Billaran example, uh, women are, are, are really running the, the show. They're, they're
better than 30 percent, but maybe um, it's a longer term uh, uh, process. Land tenure um, is a really thorny uh, issue, and I think that um, uh, uh, ethics also play a role here. Um, when and, and and that's why um, uh, improved governance um, and greater communication are probably um, uh, pretty critical uh, components. What we know is that when stakeholders are dissatisfied, that um, projects um, get destroyed. Uh, something happens. They get burned down. Um, they get torn up. Um, so. Communication and, and fairness, I think, are, are uh, uh, critical components of, of any uh, restoration intervention. Great. Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, um, there were a few questions about um, local issues and taking local issues into account. I think that's somewhat covered in land tenure, but let's have that. We're right at the hour here. Any final things about local issues as the last question? Uh, local, ever, I, I, um, I mean, really, uh, okay, so the, the local interventions and, and local communities um, uh, really have to be, um, incorporated in in the interventions uh, uh, with now the i guess the issue that is of interest to me is that okay now we've got local projects and how do we scale up and so um, uh, can we scale up by having multiple landscapes um, uh, under different ownerships and uh, 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 different um, governance structures um, combine. Um, how do those landscapes um, uh, overlap in terms of, of um, ecological uh, flows or biological flows? Um, good questions. I don't, I don't have the, the, the answer yet. Great. Thank you so uh, much. I saw, I saw in the chat somebody wanted some. Um, uh, citations, and I can provide those. I um, I don't have them at hand, but I can um, certainly email them. And I um, did include your email, Jim, um, through chair at ser.org, so you can follow up perfect. with Jim directly that way. Yeah. And we're a yeah. little... So I don't have... Sorry, I don't have a copy of the chat um, uh, box. I can send you a copy of the chat as well. Okay, and um, we've mentioned in the chat that the, all the videos in the series are posted both on YouTube and through the Ecosystem Restoration Thematic Group's webpage. So you can find all the videos from 2019 and up to current in 2020. I do wanna promote the June 19th webinar, which will focus on ecosystem management and human health. We had originally planned to focus on um, kind of a recap of the World Conservation Congress, the IUCN's big event forum and members meeting um, in France, which of course got postponed. So we're really pleased to focus on a topic that's now really front and center in all of our minds. So that's the third week of June on Friday. Um, I just wanna again, thank Jim and all of you for participating. As Brock said at the beginning, it's the same registration link each month. So save your confirmation email or let us know if you have problems. We are going to be migrating to a new system that can accommodate more people and that will automate some of the processes we'll be doing manually. So that's it for this month. Thanks again. Stay in touch. Thank you. Okay.